This is the Danger Close Podcast, Beyond the Books, with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. In the Blood is out now, hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. My guest today, Tim Kennedy. He has a new book out, Scars and Stripes an unapologetically American story of fighting the Taliban, UFC warriors, and myself. So I had a great conversation with Tim. You know him as a mixed martial arts fighter, uh, special forces operator, and probably know him from his social media presence. He has a ton going on, multiple businesses, wrote a extremely honest book here. And uh, anyway, we have a great conversation. Wish I had more time with him, but uh, without further ado, let's do it. Tim Kennedy. Dude, read the book, just finished it. And, uh, I didn't know what to expect going in, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's awesome. And I think people that, uh, uh, one that, that love you and know you and people that, uh, that don't know you at all, or have questions about, you know, what's going on, uh, with all the things you have in in your life and on social are both going to walk away with, uh, uh, a lot of respect for you and people are going to learn a lot of new things. And I got emotional in one part and it might be, I mean, it's the fall that, that chapter, that one was, I mean, I was surprised. I didn't think I was gonna get emotional at all. I'm like reading it and then get to that chapter and you're on that beach. And I don't want to really talk about when people to buy the book and read it because I think it's that powerful. Um, and everybody's going through something in their lives, you know, or will at some point. So, um, just that chapter was incredibly powerful. Was that, a, was that one of the hardest to write? And the, um, there were a couple of them. One of them was while I was, when my best friend died when I was 15 and I was walking up to my, my best friend's mom's front door for the first time. And she wouldn't look at me. And then I tried to walk into my friend's room and I couldn't walk in through the threshold, you know, and then, um, I hilariously, I'll turn my camera around. Like, this is where I'm currently recording the audio book. <laughs> nice. Then, oh, uh, you're recording it right now. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. Took, took a, took a break to, to, to talk to you. Oh man. Too cool. One hell of an author, by the way. Um, oh. I see, I see a, your book in the background, but man, you, you are, I only aspire to have a 10th of your oh, writing okay. ability, man. You are one hell of a inspirational person and one oh. amazing author. Oh man. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. But being locked in that, that little cave, um, <laughs> I'm like alone with my thoughts when I'm reading these stories out loud yeah. and I don't, how many times, Doug? Uh, five, six times, maybe. Like I've had to stop, um, not just stop reading, but like I couldn't read. Like you know, I'm, it sounds horrible. I I can't breathe. I'm yeah. like wit wiped. I'm wiped out emotionally, and um, and it's not you know they're not just my stories. They're they're stories of like brothers and sisters I served with. You know, obviously my friend. Um, failures uh, as a firefighter, as a police officer. There's there's a lot of shame in that book, and um, and it's uh, like you're talking about people that that like me and know me. But I'll tell you another group that are really going to love this book are the people that hate me, because <laughs> it it will provide uh, validity to every one of the reasons that they hate me, <laughs> and uh, it is all in there. Oh man, yeah, no, it's unapolog just like it says here, unapologetically American story, and it is definitely uh, unapologetic, open, honest. Uh, I think, uh, the people will be in, although they're gonna be interested in all of it, but, uh, the fall, especially in that woman on the cliff, I wonder, but as soon as I read that, I wondered if she's going to read this book and somehow you guys are going to connect. Cause this is the world of, with all the social media and connections, like that would not surprise me. It, it has, I, I have no idea. I was able to talk to the captain a couple of times. Um, cause I still lived in that area. I still went crabbing off the piers in Morrow Bay. Um, I still went surfing on the north side of the rock. I still went scuba diving on the south side of the rock. You know, like, so that was still my hood. I still ran into that guy a few times, you know, and I, I'd check in to let him know I was doing okay um, while I was still figuring things out. But that woman, I'm not, I have no idea who she is. I don't know. I don't know if you believe in God and I don't know if God can manifest a human on the beach. But, um, but you know, that woman saved my life. And there's no doubt, you know, Mike Goble saved my life in Afghanistan. Um, and that woman saved my life in Morro Bay, California. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, I'd be surprised actually if at, at some point you don't somehow connect with her. 
uh, God, I hope in, so. in today's world. Uh, incredible. Um, the, you talk about it in the book, but I want to, I want to ask you about it. So people that are listening, um, will, will go out and, and, and get this and read the whole thing, but walking in and meeting Chuck Liddell for the first time as a kid, I mean, crazy. I've, that's amazing. And you worked your way into that. Who knows who, who can get me in there? And then you just walk in to, uh, you know, into the, the, the gyms or fight clubs and one of the most, devastating fighters to ever step in the ring and you just go after, go after it. I mean, incredible. So he's even more impressive in human than he, in human, in, in person yeah. as a human than he was in the UFC. You know, he's this daunting, gigantic, almost caricature of a violent human. You know, he's got the shaved head with the tattoos on the side. You know, I'm a 17, 16 year old kid. And, um, you know, the six foot two collegiate wrestler that is, you know, undefeated, is standing in front of me, you know, that's traveling down to Brazil and fighting at the highest level against the best, not, not like the best at your local Indian casino. Like I aspire to for the next few years, the best in the world, you know, bare knuckle fights against Jose, Jose Pele Landis in Brazil, you know, in jungle fights, like wild. And, um, that the one, that, that guy's a gem of a human, like, you don't talk about a good egg, but even back then as a cocky, you know, barely pre pubescent <laughs> teenager walks in the door. Um, he shows me grace and, um, and, uh, ends up being like my worst friend and enemy at the same time. It probably gives me countless concussions. Yeah, no, I love that. I love it. I can picture it. I can smell it. Um, and then when it comes kind of full circle after you're not getting those hotel rooms, and then he takes you under his wing for the week later on. I mean, it's all, it's all fantastic. And I feel fortunate. I got to spend a little bit of time with him on a range not too long ago. We got to shoot together, had, had a great time. And yeah, what, what an awesome guy. What a, he what loves awesome to shoot, guy. man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's good. I mean, he was, he, he, he sure seemed like it. Yeah. Um, you didn't go party, did you? No, no. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, as much I think as those days for me are over. <laughs> okay, good. Don't try to hang with that guy. No, I think I got it. It's good to know your capabilities and your limitations. And so yeah. I think I have a pretty good sense of that at this stage, uh, stage in my life. Uh, but you're doing all that stuff. I mean, you're crushing. You, I mean, there's all so much more in the book uh, that we can't get into on, on this, but um, 9-11 and you talk about how that impacted you and the falling man in particular, and thinking about those people who had to make that choice, whether to burn alive or to make that jump. And uh, where were you when uh, that morning? And then how did you first become aware that was happening? And then when did the falling man really, uh, really become a part of your soul? Like, was it right away? Or was it later as articles and things started to um, really show the devastation and the violence and tragedy of that day? Yeah, so um, the, the falling man, and the chapter of the fall, uh, th there's kind of a double entendre there. Um, and also the duality of those two options of uh, burning alive or jumping to your death. Um, so I was working at Parable Interactive, uh, pre dot com bubble in California. And um, so this is you know, like 2000 and um, September 11th, um, 2001, like California peak.com. And I'm working at one and I would go in early in the morning because in California to deal with the East coast, uh, customer service calls. So at nine o'clock when people would be calling, um, I would be in the office by six o'clock. So I'd get there by five 30, they get the computer booted up. Um, so everybody on the East coast calling West coast, there's, you know, somebody to answer. And, um, I would open a monitor and I would, I'd run like the CNN ticker at the bottom and uh, this was like right at the beginning of, of live streaming where, you know, I don't know how, what the few seconds delay were, but um, so the ticker would be happening and somebody would be talking in the background while I was sitting there doing customer service emails and answering phones. And uh, the plane lands, crashes into the first building. And uh, then of course um, the ticker's exploding. A plane has, has crashed. I didn't see that one live. But now there's a live stream of the burning building. So I, li I watched live the next plane crash into the building, like so many Americans did. And uh, as I was watching that, and then, you know, Pentagon happens and a plane crashes, it's, it's very evident that something wrong is going on. And, um, and I, I've been a firefighter now for a few years, um, getting ready to go to the police academy when this happens. and. Um, 
So a Tascadero, our, our tallest building, I think it's like a five story building. Uh, so we have one ladder truck in the whole city. And, uh, you know, I, I am, I'm not even an engineer yet. Like I'm not even allowed to drive a fire truck. I'm a firefighter paramedic. Uh, but what I knew having already been at the fire Academy and EMT, what I was looking at in real time. And, um, before I recognized, uh, the, the horror of what was happening, it was the faces of the first responders that I was seeing. So the camera was panning around and I was seeing like, cause we couldn't hear it. Right. We couldn't smell it. We couldn't feel it. Um, uh, but everyone on the ground at ground zero could. So those firefighters and those paramedics and those EMTs and those police officers, um, they were standing there and they were watching. It wasn't debris falling out. Those were people and they knew it. It was hard to see on television. It was hard to see on a, on a monitor. But once I saw their faces, I knew what was happening. And then when the camera went back and I would see another one step off and another one step off, um, you know, as a, as a young man, you know, probably not a fully developed frontal lobe. Um, I just had rage. It was immediate. It was absolute anger. It was frustration. It was the feeling of helplessness. And it was all of the worst emotions that a young man can feel all in a moment sitting in a cubicle at a dot com in California. Man. And, uh, I mean, you go down, I think, is it the next day or very soon thereafter to enlist? And you probably thought a lot like I did, like you walk in, you sign up, you walk out the back, like Forrest Gump, get on the bus and go to boot camp. That's, that's what I thought before you could actually research these things. Um, and I think they tell you, hey, kid, get in line. It's going to be a while, especially in the days yeah. following September 11th. Um, but eventually they call you back and uh, they say, hey, there's an opening. And uh, they tell you about this. Maybe you already knew about the x-ray program, but uh, talk about the x-ray program a little bit. Uh, you're hundred percent right there at the recruiter's office. Um, you know, right, right after nine 11. And, uh, I'm one of hundreds of thousands of Americans, I'm guessing, because there are tens of thousands in, uh, in California alone and, um, trying to figure out the best way to, to get into the military. I went to the Marine recruiter. I went to the Navy recruiter, I went to the army recruiter. The only one I didn't go to was the coast guard because I wanted to go to wherever these people came from. And, uh, the 18 x-ray program was a new program. It was a, a program that had existed once before. And it was, they would take kind of collegiate athletes and they would give them an opportunity to go to directly to a special forces, a selection process with a few other, um, a tritters before that. Um, and, uh, if you get selected, then you get to go to the long Q course, the, the special forces qualifying course. And, um, so they, they were specifically poaching collegiate athletes and, um, I was a professional fighter, uh, you know, finishing up my undergrad, starting graduate school. So I was like their prime candidate, and, um, you know, went in, took the ASVAB, uh, and then took my, uh, language test and, uh, figured out if I was eligible to get an 18 x-ray contract. And then once I was, it was how fast can I get a date to ship? Yep. No, awesome. I think a lot of people are going to read this, especially, you know, people in that fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade high school, um, and th think, wow, this is, this is my path. You really describe it well in here. I don't know if the x-ray program still exists. I haven't been following along that, that closely, but usually people are in the army for six, seven years, somewhere in there, and then they get to go. And then here you come in the baby SF 18 x-rays. And I love how you describe the juxtaposition of those guys who kind of understand the army, understand the military, and then you guys coming in off the street and really being able to think Think a little bit differently. And so those chapters are fantastic. Uh, but we had a very similar experience with SEER in that I think it was harder than any other military training. Maybe that's because I was so focused on like BUDS as being hard and Hell Week as being hard. And yeah. SEER was kind of like, not an afterthought, but kind of like a, you know, Vietnam centric at the time when I went through anyway, that was awful. Like being in that prison camp was horrible. And like you say in the book, there's, there's no escaping it. It's not like you can, you can hide. You're going to get captured. You have to go through the prison camp thing. And uh, we call it camp, camp slappy, you know? I mean, you're just getting, oh. it, it was awful because you can't do it. I mean, it's horrible. I hate that because you can't do anything back. You have to like go play the game, get through this thing. Everything, all your senses are telling you that you're really in a prison camp. They do a good job with that. This different language and the accents and then the smells are cooking this weird stuff, at least when I went through. Uh, so it's a really strange thing to experience. But uh, I hated every second of that. That was just 
That's just awful. Yeah. It, it, it's so important though, you know? Um, and it's, it's so funny guys like us remember the sounds and the smells and, and the difference of it. And, you know, as you, as I think back often to, you know, POWs of Vietnam, uh, like Colonel Nick Rowe and how weird it would have been to walk into that POW camp, right? No American food, no American beer, no American, um, no English, no Americans. And, um, like how odd everything would feel. And I, and, and my hat's off to the the cadre that run those schools because they they really do create an environment that feels so alien that mm-hmm. takes us so out of our elements. You know, like uh, it's hard to get me out of like my processes and my my kind of effective methods of of achieving a goal. Well, put you know put put guys like us in Camp Slappy, beat us, starve us, sleep deprive us give us weird food and uh, weird smells, weird sights, weird sounds, constant interrogations. And um, I'm out of my element, you know, I'm out yeah, of my They do process. a great job with that. They do a fantastic job. They did one. I did a pilot one later on in an advanced seer type thing where they more focused it on getting snatched off the street in Beirut or something. And it was like, yeah. a, uh, they had different smells, different, but, but they're still the same type of a deal. And then had to deal with CNN if they came in and, you know, tried to, and you were a hostage. So that was, that was interesting. Um, but what I didn't realize is that you were Charlie third of the seventh. And I didn't yep. know that before. I missed that and you know, everything that the, everything that I've I've read or heard you talk about before. But um, I got to go into Haiti with Charlie Third of the Seventh as the sole Navy liaison person with them back in, in Haiti in 2004. And wow. uh, it was awesome. It was so cool seeing big army come together and take over this hangar wherever we were and then do this huge uh, like sand table where everybody's moving around. But I went in with those guys and uh, it was awesome. I had such a good experience. That was one of my first SF experiences and I've had a lot, had a lot more later on that were all fantastic. Just loved working with the SF guys, particularly the warrant officers, especially after they go through that warrant officer training where they're just like full on in counterinsurgency, like yeah. warrior poet mode. Um, yeah. that was that you guys do a great job with the, with that. But yeah, we had, so we had a little overlap. So you go to Charlie third or seventh right off the bat. That's right. Um, that was, uh, probably not a great idea. Uh, <laughs> They had not done it before. I don't know if the 18 x-ray is a great idea. And I know for certain that taking an 18 x-ray and putting them in an elite special operations, you know, at the time it was like a counterterrorism human, uh, a hostage rescue unit, uh, bad plan, bad plan, <laughs> you know, let's, let's, let's get some, uh, the wet behind his ears and, uh, you know, at least let his balls drop before we throw him into <laughs> anything that is significant. Yeah. Yeah. That, but you get to go there and you're with, uh, John McPhee. Is that how you say, you say the last name correctly? That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's crazy. Like I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. And, uh, there's an interesting, and you're owned after Zarqawi. So you we have another overlap there in that I'm working for the agency in Baghdad in 2006, throughout the same time as the, once again, the sole military liaison and all those times when I'm the sole military liaison to something, I love it. Or the sole Navy, like it's great. There's no Navy above me. There, I, I love those things. Um, yeah. so it was a highlight of my, my time, but we overlapped a little bit there, but you're hunting Zarqawi as part of this huge task force that's going out. And I remember how it was at the time, uh, targeting him and everybody that was involved in all of that. Um, but, uh, there's something else that happens there and, you know, it's, it's very humbling, um, you know, to read about, but for, for you to write about it and to have, uh, after a mission go in and have all the guys in the unit put on the gloves and have you do this smoker. Um, what was that? I mean, you describe it in the book and, and so well, and you can like feel for you, but you take, you kind of take two lessons from it. And I found that, that fascinating. Um, one, like a little bit of humble pie, but then at the same time, you're like, it took this many guys, this many rounds <laughs> to put me down, uh, in order to bloody me. Uh, what was that? What was that like? How do you look back on it now? I'm, I'm embarrassed about that, that moment. You know, um, there's, I still talk to a lot of guys from that first ODA, you know, that first ODA, the first time, you know, I've been on what, six ODAs now. And, um, you know, I was in a, in a 17 year career, uh, but looking back to that first one and, you know, walking up to my boss and being like, you know, you shouldn't have kicked me off this helicopter. I should be the one that's on here. I'm the guy that's like the best and the brightest, the strongest, and the fastest. I'm the best shooter. You know, like just hearing those words come out of my mouth and thinking back to that, like how shameful that is. And I'm so impressed that John just didn't murder me on the spot. You know, like you just would have like taken off his tom- tomahawk and he would carry a tomahawk and just like kill me right there. In a, um, thankfully he didn't, but his, his patience and putting me on QRF, you know, like, again, I did a 
decent job at QRF, but I didn't go above and beyond like I should have. And then he comes back from a, a great mission and I should have been there helping them take off their gear, change out their batteries, you know, top off their magazines, you know, prep all their flashbangs for the next day. But instead I'm sitting there like a like petulant child bitching, complaining, and whining about why I didn't get to go on this mission. Uh, so I'm embarrassed by that. You know, like I think, uh, I hope those guys forgive me, you know, for me being as lame as I was, but that's how lame I was. Um, so, you know, he tells the team to get their gloves and they, t- they go down to, uh, one of those army tents that has a single air conditioner in it, dirt floor on the bottom. And, uh, the, the walls are, are hammered and staked into the ground. Um, so there's like this constant overpressure from this, you know, positive pressure ventilation coming in from the air. It's a weird, it's a, it's a weird environment because it feels like you walk into a pressure tank. When you close that door, all the air is getting pushed out that one door and, um, it smells weird because it's, it's army air conditioning <laughs> and, um, we touch gloves and, and, uh, I go and I go to fight every single person on the ODA. And what I thought was going to be a moment of like me showing them turns into like me looking at my own, you know, I'm bleeding out of, it felt like I was bleeding out of my pores, yeah. my sweat glands, you know, like that's how bad they beat me. Yeah. I can, I could picture that like a movie, like, you know, like a good lesson, like you take everybody in the one round, you think it's over type of a thing. And then they line right back up and go through again and again, like that's a, that was a really, and, and it was really cool that you wrote about that. I think, I mean, it shows that you're showing, you're, you're writing about everything and not leaving, not leaving anything out, not sugarcoating it. And, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of lessons in there. So for the yeah. the next young Tim Kennedy, that's coming up through the ranks, you know, that's, it's fighting his way through high school and, and after, and wants to join the military and all that stuff. Like there's some, some great lessons. Uh, and then all army combative championships is what three of them that you did. Is that. Yeah. Did three, three of them. Of them. And uh, if people can read all about that in the book, I'm fascinated by that because it's such a, I mean, such a, a cool thing that, that the army does, but um, you go to ranger school and I love that part also, like how, the, how they make you go with John when you didn't really need to be the honor graduate. Um, so that was, that was cool. That was like a movie as well. Um, but right after that, you're invited to go fight and you do. And then the arm this is where the army starts to figure out that you're, fighting and you have this other thing on the side and, um, how did, how did that work? And so I, uh, this, this is, it was, this is so sad because even today, like in this moment, as you and I talk, it's a battle that I, that I, that I face often, you know, it's, it's some people recognizing that there's opportunity here, you know, like whether it's recruiting or positively pertain, portraying what the SF, um, individual looks like, or is this a risk to force? Um, is, am I, too big of like digital footprint to be, to be in special operations. Um, and those are all fair questions. And those are all questions that, um, I would ask if I were in their positions, but there, you know, in 2007, 2008, as I'm, you know, I've done some small fights, but now I'm in a big fight on Fox and, uh, they say, they see a shaved head, um, muscle bound, army ranger from Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Well, there are no rangers at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. <laughs> and, uh, so like something doesn't compute. Um, and it definitely doesn't compute in the brain of a command sergeant major that is watching one of his guys walk out to the octagon. He's like, dude, that guy better have a leave form for this weekend. Yeah. Uh, which I did, you yeah. know, but, uh, that was the start of a battle that's gone on now for 15 years, 14 years about, uh, what are we going to do with Tim? Yeah, no, it's interesting from the outside. So I first became aware of you, I think in Iraq, 2011, as we're shutting down the South in Basra and in the talk, and that's just where I have more SF guys as part of this unit than I do, than I do SEALs. And it was great. I'm, I still talk to those guys today. We had a great experience because um, we had to be so adaptive shutting this thing down. Nobody really knew if we're staying and we're going. It was very dynamic time. But um, somebody, there's a, a magazine is lying in the talk and you're on the cover. And it says like Army SF, uh, UFC or, com- or Strike Force or something. I can't remember. But I think that is the first time that I became aware of you. Unless I'm like have total, you know, uh, my memories are kind of blurring together. But I think there was some sort of a martial art UFC yeah. some kind of magazine around that time frame that you're on the cover of. Yeah. Do I have that right? Or is that? Yeah, probably you, not- yeah. yeah, 2010, 2011, you know, I'm undefeated in the IFL. I'm undefeated in strike force. Um, you know, I'm on like a 10, 12, 
win fight string fighting like kind of the who's who of the current day and uh i'm kill i'm still currently special forces i'm still a green beret and uh so like this is the first time and uh and they didn't know what to do. So I'm on covers of lots of magazines. And, you know, I, I still, I just wanted to be left alone. I was like, can I just stay on my team? I will fight whenever I can fight if I'm not deployed or going to a school. And the army was like, ultimately, you know, like, no, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when you have to make, make your decision. Uh, but at this point, do you already have like a, uh, like, is there what? Is Instagram around yet? I don't even know, but there's certainly Facebook's been around a couple of years. Maybe do you have a, that kind of a footprint yet? Or is it mostly like more traditional media? No, th- yeah, th- this is like my, my space and, uh, <laughs> uh, beginning of Facebook and, um, you know, b- by no means are there sponsorships coming from those, you know, the, um, I did have like good sponsors because I was like the good American boy type mm-hmm. thing, you know, like the military guy that fights. So kind of some of the hard nosed brands were, were behind me, um, you know, but really the, the, the cool thing that saved the day was the army national guard. Um, there's two special forces groups in the national guard and, um, you know, in the national guard, you have to have a civilian job. Some guys are fighters. Some guys are firefighters. Some guys are police officers. Some guy work for three letter agencies, you know, but they, they kind of dual hat. They're, part-time special forces and part-time civilians. And sometimes those skills overlap. And, uh, and I asked them, I was like, so, uh, is this my civilian job? They're like, yeah, that's, you get to do your civilian job. I don't get to tell you what you do for your civilian job. And, uh, you get to stay special forces. Like, yes. (laughs) So I kind of got to start fighting and doing uh, green beret stuff. Yeah, no, it seemed like a perfect fit. But before that, you go to sniper school. And I love the story, you and Mike Glover and your spotter. And for people who don't know, a spotter is a very important part of this uh, two-man sniper element, uh, especially in sniper school. And it's very, it, it's yeah. good to have a spotter that knows what he's doing, maybe even who is better at it than you are. And, yeah. uh, and your guy quits, like at your last shot. And uh, Mike Glover raises his hand and said, I'll, I'll call that wind or whatever, and walks up and calls it. And then you press that trigger and ding. <laughs> Dude, such a baller move by Mike. I love Mike. Yeah, I get to so work great. with Mike often, but he's such a great human. He is. And one of my favorite parts, parts, and I, you know, it's not really ex- like, I, you don't get to point it out in the book because it's kind of understated. The cat, the cadre looked at Mike and they're like, well, um, you know, I get one bullet. I get one target. If I get a first round hit, I get a go at special forces sniper school. At the time it was called, called special, tar- uh, special operations target addiction course. Mm-hmm. And, um, if I miss I'm out and, uh, when they asked if somebody would come and cover for me and Mike Glover stood up, Mike, um, they also asked Mike if he would, if he would bet his graduation on it. And Mike says, wouldn't change my answer. Wow. Like what a baller, Yeah, you know, to like, just look right at him and be like, bro, it's not going to change what I'm going to do here. And what I'm going to do here is get a first round hit on that target. That is Pretty awesome. Cool. Yeah, that's next level right there. Yeah, I love Mike yeah. down at Fieldcraft Survival. He's right down the road, so I get to see him. I'm very fortunate that I get to spend some time with him here, not uh, not infrequently. So yeah. um, I think yeah, another solid guy. So Brad Keys, um, who was my sp- sniper partner, I don't name in the book. Um, guy, guy had already been to war, and um, you know, l- having spent so much time as as a sport, it is almost indescribable how much time you spend with your sniper partner, right? Like I know how he breathes. I know how he breathes when he sleeps. I know how he smells. I know how he smells when he's stressed. I know how he smells when he's hungry. You know, like I know what his piss smells like when he's dehydrated. You know, like that is how much intimacy we have, you know, and, and as we're sitting there staring at a tree together for 14 hours, of course, we're going to talk. So I know everything about Brad. And, um, you know, that guy is, is carrying a lot of demons by the time he gets to these schools. So people look at these schools, sniper school, Sephardic, ranger school, you know, they see like go, no goes, but you forget about the individual that is physically carrying everything from war with them into these moments. You know, like, oh, that, that guy was a no-go at ranger school. What a loser. Dude, like he lost his best friend five months ago. Cool. Mm-hmm. You want to tell him how to do a combat operation and go lead an infantry unit? Awesome. You know, like, you're an asshole. Like, the, it's really difficult to explain in peak war, you know, in 2006, 2007, 2008, 
where guys are now three, four deployments deep. Um, even going to a school, schools are heavy. You know, guys are carrying stuff when they get there. No, that's so true. And then they carry it, yeah, from from then on and everything that they that they do. And speaking of that, the Afghanistan chapters that you write are, uh, I mean, some of the best writing that describes modern warfare, particularly as it pertains to Afghanistan, that I've I've yet read. Um, and of course, what stands out to me, a couple of things, but one of them is the way you describe um, being a sniper, like that that paragraph, the one I talked about before about the fall on the beach, and then the one about being a sniper and what you see through that scope. Um, I haven't read it described that way before. And I've read a lot of things about snipers and have a little bit of background there, but uh, that was powerful. Uh, how is that to write or to think? Oh, through? Dude, that was a chapter as I'm looking over here, um, begrudgingly at my, my chamber of darkness. That was a, that was a paragraph. And that was a chapter where I was crying. You know, um, I have, uh, I'm, I'm in my office right now and on the wall, a couple of rooms away is this, it's a musket. Like it's a breech loading musket mm -hmm. and, um, underneath it and the date of that gunfight. And, um, one of the, one of the guys that I shot, um, that was the weapon that he was carrying. It was four or 500 meters away. I can't see the weapon. Mm -hmm. And it was just a military aged man in a combat zone, in a battle, in the middle of a tick, carrying a weapon. So he goes in the dirt and, um, he's ends up being in our direction of travel. And I go and recover this weapon. And it is a, it is like an eight, a late 1800s breech load musket. Yep. It was a child. Like it was a, a young man, you know, barely, barely of age to even hold a gun that weight. And, um, war you know yeah. war it's fucking sucks yeah and there's another one that stood out to me um well, there's a couple of things but I, but uh one of them is this school the enemy using a school as a base of operations essentially oh, as their asshole. headquarters as their yes in a multi-day engagement um and uh you talk about that in the in the valley of death and and similar you ask if hey why if why, let's let's level this thing. We have air power. You know, let's let's destroy this thing because that's the enemy's base of operations here. And you're told no, um, and then you have a reaction to that. Um, and very similar. That stood out to me. We had a very similar thing happen in Najaf because the enemy we pushed the enemy back, and it was eleven days, two week campaign, eleven days really of pitched street fighting, and we pushed them back to the Imam Ali Mosque in Old Town Najaf, which is like one of the holiest sites in all of Islam. And uh, I asked that same question. And at this, by this point, I'm an officer. I uh, started enlisted and then became an officer. But uh, I requested to level it. And I got told the same thing you did. No. And, you know, of course, at the time, you're like, they're right there. They're all of them in there. They, I, we have the place essentially surrounded. Um, so, yeah, so that was a no. And then, of course, the peace negotiation came out and they left and we fought them again later. But, uh, but yeah, what did that feel like to ask that question and have the enemy know where they are? But then not be able to to take it out it, i mean it, it's not like where they are hiding that is where they were conducting combat operations against us that's where they're doing their call for fires and their indirect fires they're shooting mortars from the backside of that school you know a school that we built probably with ag agency funds um and uh you know hearts through the hearts and minds we're, we're gonna we're gonna win over the afghan people no like the taliban if we build them a well they're going to own that well. You know, if we build them a school, that is going to be their headquarters. And, uh, and so it was there as uh, it was frustrating. It was infuriating. Um, but that's just what it is. Yeah. You know, I hope that, that senior level military leaders or those on their way to be senior level military leaders and politicians read this book um, because it really paints a picture of what it's like on the ground without this geopolitical strategic type of a lens. It's what it's like on the ground. And so they can say, oh, here's what our, our strategy was. Here's what's happening on the ground. There's something, there, there's a disconnect here. Uh, so we can stay doing this thing on the ground for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, uh, yeah. or we can get a little smarter up here, learn from history and make some better decisions, maybe hopefully going forward and turn that experience into wisdom. But I really hope that our senior level leaders read this and not just start stick with reading what they usually do, which is you know their, their friends' memoirs who are at those senior level you know, positions. Um, I think it's, I mean, I think it's that important. And then th there's another 
paragraph in there that hit me really hard too. And you were so honest and, and open about this grenade that you threw. And I think that chapter is going to really help or those paragraphs are really going to help a lot of other people, a lot of other veterans that, uh, that, that were in or dealing with similar feelings. Um, and being open and honest about that, how hard was it to write that? And then what was your intent on writing that? Was it to just help others or was it cathartic in any way? I mean, it's just, a, it's war. Yeah, it's war. Um, I don't remember what interview it was in, um, but I, I mentioned that I killed women and children. And um, you know, that has been like a moniker that every person that wants an excuse to hate me, they throw on there every time. Like he is admitted, even bragged about. I was like, it's one of the most darkest, soulless moments of my life that is completely out of my control. You know, there's a machine gun shredding my men, shredding my friends. Like Mike Keller, that that was in that vehicle, um, he and I went to basic training together. Like he went to he and I went to airborne school together. He and I went to SOP C together. He and I went to Special Forces Selection together. He and I went to the Q course together. He and I went to seven special forces group together. So he's in that vehicle that is getting pieced apart as Mike Goebel and I are going up to this other door. And um, there's a machine gun barrel sticking out of this tiny little window. And I lob a grenade through that window. And of course, the bad guy has barricaded himself with women and children. You know, and in in a world that is absolute grayness, and that grayness is murky, dark, and evil, and that is the thing that is war, nothing is clear. Nothing is black and white. Nothing is right and wrong. There's just these, gr- these, these varying degrees of horrible. Mm-hmm. And um, so everybody that has ever lobbed a hateful remark about soldiers like until you've been there until you've felt um what it's like to have to make a decision in that moment of taking somebody's life to try to protect those around you and that decision be the wrong decision but you made the best decision with the information that you had at your disposal then you can just fucking royally fuck off (laughs) yeah i think it's going to help people more than just with that though i mean i I think yeah i mean it's it i think you're gonna help a lot of people with this with this book. Um, and, uh, I wanted to ask about the shy tack rifle because the only time I came across a shy tack was when I was working with Marine Marsoc debt one, like their little, their thing before it became Marsoc their test run. And I, I saw one there and they had one cause they were testing it and they could get away with it. But how did you guys get a shy tack? And, uh, it's on my list. Like I, I, I can't wait to get one of those things. It's just so cool. It's yeah. just a cool. Looking it was weapon. cool. Um, what I was trying to get was the, the Australian, SAS guys, their snipers had 338 Mapuas. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, I think they were the first ones maybe to field them. Mm-hmm. I, I, I can't answer that. It was the first time I ever saw that bullet. And I was like, that's a laser. And I want that bullet. Mm-hmm. You know, like th- that, that 250 grains traveling at 3,200 feet per second. Give me that bullet, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I was like you for this Afghanistan deployment. I was a lone man. Like I had no. I had a sniper buddy, but, um, he had stuff come up personally and he had to go back to the States. So I had that oversight of one Sergeant major, one Sergeant major Flaherty. And, uh, besides him, uh, I was going down to the checks, to the British, uh, to the Canadians, to the Australians. And anytime they're going out the wires, like, Hey bro, do you want to, what do you think about having a little SF sniper? Just go on as your liaison and, uh, and a little additional asset, just a little bolt on help, you know? Mm. So I was able to get on a bunch of rad missions. And uh, by doing that, like hopscotching through all these different units, I was also kind of finding out where all the good stuff was. So when I knew I was going to be going um, on this specific mission to fire base Anaconda, and Anaconda, like if that base had, I think it had been overrun once or twice already. Oh. But in the, in the time that we had that forward operating base, the Taliban physically tried to overrun it. Like Charlie has breached the wire they're doing a hand to hand fighting like green berets on Taliban inside the base on two different occasions. That's fire base Anaconda. So when I knew I was going in there, man, I was, I was, I was hedging my bets. I was trying to put every piece of equipment I could get my, my greedy little fat fingers on (laughs) so I could rain down steel death. Oh man. Yeah. Shy tack. That's on my list. Um, but, uh, so you come back from that deployment, which is, I mean, you're active. You guys are getting after it on that one. Uh, come home and now comes UFC and then comes some TV spots and then hunting Hitler, which was awesome, by the way. Um, if anybody hasn't watched hunting Hitler, like they should definitely check out that series. Cause you guys did an amazing 
amazing job with that. I, I, I watch it with the kids. I watch it with my family. Uh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. That was really good. I watched it as soon as it, as soon as it came out. Um, but, uh, I guess of all those things, honey, Hitler seems to have made an impact on you, um, for, for a few different reasons, but I mean, you're out there and you're eventually essentially hunting Nazis. Yeah. Not, I mean, not essentially uh, we are. So when, um, they first contacted me, they're like, Hey, we need somebody that has like hunted people. I was like, cool. Got that. Like, um, can you fly drones? He's like, Oh yeah, I can fly <laughs> drones. Like, are you familiar with the ground putting train radar? And like, yeah, that's how we find caves in Taliban, in Taliban, Afghanistan. And they're like, uh, do you speak Spanish? So I was like, yeah, I speak Spanish. It's like, all right. So can you consult for this investigation that we're doing for the history channel where we're trying to find Nazis? And I was like, Oh hell yeah, I can. This sounds amazing, you know. And then um, a couple of a couple of days into it, they're just like, "Can you do this? Would you go hunt Nazis for us?" It's like, I mean, you're talking about <laughs> making a, a a dude that has spent his mo- the majority of his adult life in war a wet dream is asking him to fight maybe the only worst bad guy left on the planet, which is Nazis. And uh, so I tried to hide my erection, and then <laughs> I packed my bags and went to South America. Amazing. I was thinking about it actually recently. I was just in Argentina around where you guys were. And uh, so I was thinking about you while I was, while I was down there, but yeah, that what an incredible experience. And I love how you talk about it in the book. I'm glad you just didn't like leave it as a sentence or a paragraph. I love how you got into it in the book. It, it's fascinating. But uh, then you do some ra- the range 15 movie, uh, hard to kill show, which you have a different experience on. Um, and during this time you're starting sheepdog response and a, a few other businesses. So how is this How's this going as you transition for start juggling businesses now? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, I, I was using kind of vertic- the vertical leadership um, and task org of, of the military, you know, so having directors and, and CEOs and, and positions that are like commanders, you know, and having their chiefs of staff or senior enlisted leaders. And like, that's, that's how I was kind of building these organizations. And, um, you know, so in my absence as a commander, deploys forward, you know, you have your stay behind team or vice versa as like a team goes forward and I'm staying behind. Um, that's just kind of how we operated. If you like walk down the halls of, of this office, you get like Sergeant Major Matt Smith, you know, he was a 20 year green beret. And then you get to the next room, which is Justin Jones, who's a Marine recon guy. And then you get to Zach Mayo. He's our customer service, Navy, um, Navy veteran. And then you like, as you keep going down, Yako Kalili, um, you know, worked with 10th and 1st Special Forces Group in the hand-to-hand combat, black belt jiu-jitsu. That's just like what this building is. Mm-hmm. And it made it very effortless to, to run businesses while I was going out to continue to build a brand to help a cog in the wheel, the wheel being yeah. the business, every one of those cogs, maybe a TV show, maybe a, maybe a podcast, maybe a magazine, uh, maybe another fight uh, just to keep that wheel rolling. Yeah, no, I was taking notes here at the end, like the end of this book. So I'm like, ah, oh, chief of staff. I'm like, I think I need one of those at this point. Cause I'm like juggling all do. this stuff and I'm like exhausted. Do. I don't sleep. I don't eat right. And I haven't exercised in like three years. So, uh, yeah, I need to start getting a little smarter about these things. Um, but I, I'm looking at the clock, but I do want to ask you about, um, the, the Houston Super Bowl and human trafficking and what yeah. you were doing and how that was shut down. Um, when you built essentially target packages around all these human, this human traffic syndicate or syndicates, um, and got shut down by our own government. And I wanted to ask you about that and then why you think it was shut down. Um, I mean, so I've, I conjecture mm-hmm. why it was shut down. So the, the largest human trafficking events, um, up in American history was the Houston Super Bowl. And uh I think uh the Patriots were fighting or playing against <laughs> like the, the Panthers I or I don't know. I don't know either. Yeah. Um and uh with lots of men traveling with lots of money come you know to a sporting event with lots of testosterone. So they're away from their families and um uh, you know like drugs and alcohol are present, you know, big parties. Um, so comes illicit activities, you know, drugs and who carries drugs into parties. You know, it's not like a bad guy with a grill of money on his teeth, right? It's going to be like a 19, 17, 15 year old little, little cutie with a tiny little backpack that has a bunch of Coke in it, you know, 
And, um, you know, that girl, after she tries to sell the Coke, um, or whatever drug she's smuggling in there, she is then going to try to find a few Johns at the party. And then after the party, and she makes whatever money she can for her pimp, then a couple hours later, the guys that didn't find somebody to go home with, they're going to be picking up the call or they're going to be going to, you know, back page or scarlet book, trying to find somebody that's available. And then there's the next wave of, of money for these poor girls. And then, um, you know, so I, I kind of line out very clearly in the book what the, what the, the battle, the battle rhythm Mm -hmm. for a prostitute, a human trafficked victim looks like. And, uh, so we were there as part of a nonprofit to do this big sting operation and this collaborative bilateral, um, task force. And, uh, we are working with a variety of organizations, but ultimately the jurisdiction falls to the county and the city. Cause, um, until we're like making arrests for people that have smuggled people across state lines, these aren't federal charges. Mm -hmm. These, these are local state charges. And, um, that is, that's really the gate, you know, that's really the choke point, which is the, the local level politicians that, um, a lot of where these illicit activities were happening were strip clubs and the strip club owners were paying large donations to these specific, uh, local politicians. And, uh, these local politicians ultimately were protecting these businesses from, the legal repercussions of what was happening there. So we are target packages, very mil- military, um, close target reconnaissance. Um, are we allowed to say that? Yeah, so. So. No, you're good. Okay. So, uh, we, we, we treated each or one of these CTRs and, um, we would do a meetup where I would elicit to meet up with a prostitute. The prostitute would show up. And we would track that vehicle back to where the other prostitutes are. And then we would try to identify women under the age of 18. And then, you know, the pecking order, like a kill board, right? Like here's the pimp, um, Mm -hmm. here's his security, here's his muscle, here's his drivers, here's the bottom bitch that you call them damn. And, um, and then here are all the prostitutes. And then here are all the potential human trafficked victims. Um, And we would build target packages of, rescuing some girls, arresting other guys. And ultimately the goal was to do one big sweep of all of these criminals all at one time. So we had built about 80 packages over the course of 70 something hours. So 70 hours of no sleep, 70 hours of, um, you know, this started on Thursday and finished on Sunday. And, um, of those 70, we were able to get two, two, we were able to arrest and prosecute. Um, and these are, these are turnkey target packages. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have photos, videos, names, bank accounts, um, what room they were in, who the John was, what the name of the John was, how much the John paid them. Here's the video. I mean, like everything, yeah. like as a good Samaritan, me handing this over, this is like yeah. too easy. Instead it was like, nah, nah, just let him go. I mean, it's interesting when you talk about it at that tactical level of doing these physical reconnaissance and putting the physical package together on a wall in a, in a, uh, an actual physical package and handing it over and then them saying no. And then you think about how much information is collected on all of us daily by all these different tech companies, the internet of things, all of this data storage, mass surveillance. And I mean, you can feed me up an ad of something I talked with my wife about last night. And all of a sudden something from like REI pops up and I'm like, what? I've never talked about REI before. And there it is. Well, there are electronic target packages. I would, I mean, information is out there that would allow wow. us to go after all these guys, all these human trafficking syndicates. And there's a reason why we don't. And that part is extremely disheartening. Um, but all you have to do is think about it a little bit to figure out why. And the other part is that that human trafficking syndicates, obviously, as you know, um, people aren't move. It's not just people that move through these things. It's also weapons, it's drugs, it's ever, these different rat lines. I mean, they, they move more, they move more illicit things. Uh, yeah. they're, they're very, very common. That's why DEA was so critical right at the outset of September 11th, because all the things that they track with drugs, well, if, if people, weapons, terrorists are all moving in the same, essentially the same lines. But, um, 
you know, I want to also ask you about in a couple minutes left. I just want to ask you about the school that you're starting out because that is, seems like such a passion project of yours. I've thought about this so often over the years, um, pretty much in my head saying, I wish someone would, uh, you know, yeah. that sort of a thing. So, um, but you did. And how's that going? Man, it is hard. Yeah. Um, of all of the, you know, a lot of businesses and, um, of all the businesses, I spend more time on that business and, um, I buy, I get, I've, you know, I've lost tens of thousands of dollars, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars opening that business. Um, and, uh, I'm not done. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it is strategically organized to make it very difficult for private business to be successful in education. Um, mm. uh, because the current educators have a monopoly on how it is and where the money is being spent. That's why like programs like, uh, um, like right, right to choose for school or school vouchers, all of those things are so important, but, um, our schools have done us dirty. Like they've done us so wrong. And, uh, and it is, it is, it is designed to make it very difficult for other people to come in and do it better. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that needs to happen. Need, obviously, there needs to be change. Obviously, there's a market for it. People don't want to keep sending their kids to this school, these schools where they're indoctrinated and then come home and you have to deal with it on the home front. But you want them to actually learn lessons, uh, life, good life lessons, learn to think logically, learn to fight. Like All these things that you're doing with that school are so important. So I really hope it continues. And I maybe hope there's some some benefactor out there that thinks the same way, like an Elon Musk. It's like, hey, let's do this, <laughs> or something. I don't know, but it, there's it's, yeah, it's, that'd, that'd be helpful, you know. But I'm gonna keep on. <laughs> it matters. Um, there there are future, so I'm just yeah. gonna keep pushing. Oh, love it, man, love it. And then Afghanistan. You go back this last year. I mean, August of last year. Um, obviously, I mean, just so painful to watch um, to see us give up. Bagram and go to this airport, give up a tactically advantageous position to put our troops at a tactically disadvantageous position. Um, I mean, you don't need a degree in military history or studied any tactics ever served in the military to look at something and apply some common sense, um, which is why so many people were outraged. And interestingly enough, it's hardly even talked about. Um, but one of the people that was uh, wounded severely at, um, at Abbey Gate, um, the, a friend of mine is here, actually, he's down the hallway right now at the house, uh, training up a dog for her. So she can't walk anymore. Uh, she's a Marine and training up a service dog for her through Rescue 22. But we lost uh, 13 people that day. They were put in a position that the probably the people making those decisions wouldn't put their son or daughter. And uh, and you were right there. I mean, you were on on base when that happened. Or not base. Yeah. On that, the airfield. Yeah, at the airfield. Um yeah, I, I went for this organization called Save Our Allies. It was, um, you know, officially an NGO that was working on behalf of the government. Uh, there, there's been a lot of conjecture about like how I was there, why I was there, what I was doing. You know, like this, this um, cowboy out there doing these things like a lone wolf. That couldn't be further further from the truth. You know, we're, we were there on behest of um, a variety of government agencies and uh, government officials to go specifically and strategically pull people out. The task force on the ground forward off operating base in UAE, you know, so everybody that thinks that they know what happened in Afghanistan, you have no idea. You know, like there's, there's probably about 25 people on the planet that, that have a clue. And if you're not one of those 25, then you don't know, um, all the way up to the joint chief of staff level, um, approval, you know, center and congressional approval for us to do what we did. We had military planes, C-17s, you know, our vetting process to the people that we moved out. These were requests that were coming from, from, um, directly from the government and, uh, 10 days on the ground, you know, we move 11, 12,000 people out of Afghanistan. When I say we moved, not on, we privately moved our allies and, you know, translators, former special forces, commandos, um, Americans, green card holders, SIV, um, special immigration visa holders, P1 visa holders, all of those people, we physically moved out. Like we went into Kabul, grabbed them, pull them into Hikaya, smuggling them past American checkpoints, Taliban checkpoints onto the airstrip into our hangar. And then ultimately into our privately funded planes and flew them out. Um, 17,000 people so far is what we got out of it, out of a gas Afghanistan. And we did 12,000 in 10 days. Yeah. 
yeah, you describe it in here and that, uh, was it a Colonel or someone who had a very, uh, had an issue, I guess is the best way to say it with you guys, the West Point chapter and the ring knocking and the whole, th- I mean, it, it's an incredible chapter to read, especially for people that have just, just saw a few of your posts on social media or whatever else and are curious about what went on down there. I mean, they have to get this and read it and then save our allies. They're also doing some stuff in Ukraine. A buddy of mine is over there, was over there, uh, with them a, few, a little bit ago, not too long ago, texting me from over there and showing me some of the things that are going on. Oh, they're not supposed to know that? No, no, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of out there. Uh, we have like the public facing effort in Ukraine. Um, you know, several allies, Ben, Benjamin Hall, Fox correspondent that got blown up in, uh, Ukraine. Um, yeah. so, some of our guys went and physically got him out. I think we've delivered, I don't even know how many tens of thousands of, of goods to the people of Ukraine, to, you know, water purification systems, medical supplies. So we are, we are elbows deep in Ukraine right now. Um, while we're concurrently still working in Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, to get people out. Wow. I mean, you got a lot going on. You got a lot going on. So I know you got to get back to it, um, to, to recording the rest of this, but, uh, scars and stripes, um, cause you talk about it at the end of the book, but for those who start off with scars and stripes here, just as the, as the title, uh, where did that come from? And, uh, and what does that, what does that mean to you? Hey, so, uh, the, the the stripes part, you know, as you're kind of like earning your time in, you're getting your stripes. So in the military, in my like, I just had to a couple of days ago as I'm going to Nick Palmashano, the my co-author of that book. His son is graduating from um, ROTC, so I had to go update my uniform because I'm going to go do his first salute. Wow. So on my sleeve are stripes, the stripes, the number of years of service that I have, um, the number of months I have in a combat zone, and obviously my stripes of my rank. Um, and then, you know, behind me over my shoulder, you have, uh, stripes of the flag that I love so much over your left shoulder. I see it, you know, it's, it's, um, I've, I've seen it folded and handed to widows. I've carried it, um, as I've lost friends back to the places where they died. And, uh, so the stripes alone are, um, so powerful in so many different layers of ways. It's not just red, white, and blue stripes there. there there's also like the military level of stripes and then the scars, um, you know, it's not just, obviously my face is covered in them from, from 17, 18 years of being a professional <laughs> fighter. Um, you know, my, if I take my shirt off, you'll see where bullets melted onto my flesh from brass casings getting stuck in my body armor. I'm sure you have them. Every one of us do on our back and our shoulders or brass casings literally just mm-hmm. melt our flesh. You can see burn marks on my arms. You know, like this is, um, I carry inside and outside all of the, the scars from what I've done my entire life. And, um, and those two things, the scars and stripes are the things that shape us. Those are the things that, um, that create and make who are, who we are as a person or our perspective as a human. There you go. I can't think of a better way to, to end it than that. And, uh, and let you get back to recording the, the rest of this for the audio book. So, man, thank you for taking the time. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you for being so open and honest in this, in this book. Like I said, I think it's going to help a lot of people, um, not just understand you, but help them in their, their, their own lives as well. So, uh, thank you for doing that. Thanks for your service to the nation. And hopefully we'll, uh, meet up in person one day soon. I would love that. Jack, you do never change who we are, man. I'm so proud to, uh, you know, be distantly connected to you and, um, you are just such a great force for good for our community. And, uh, you know, anything I can ever do, never hesitate to reach out, man. I'm just proud to know you. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Awesome. Well, Hey, take care out there. Be safe. And, uh, yeah, keep crushing. Awesome. Take care. The home buying experience can be a daunting one. Navy federal credit union is here to help military members and their families tackle home ownership. They offer mortgage options with zero down payment. So you don't need to wait years to save. They offer mortgage options that don't require private mortgage insurance, so you'll save money each and every month. Members save $2,500 on average when they choose Navy Federal for their mortgage. With resources like Realty Plus, you can get an experienced real estate agent, and Navy Federal is a top VA home lender. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Insured by NCUA, an equal housing lender. 
I want to thank my friends at Black Rifle Coffee for sponsoring the Danger Close podcast. I've been a huge fan for the longest time. I drink Black Rifle Coffee every day. And if you keep your eyes peeled, you will notice that perhaps Chris Pratt is wearing a Black Rifle Coffee t-shirt, not unsimilar to this one, in the Amazon series adaptation of The Terminal List. Now you can go to blackriflecoffee.com slash danger close and use code danger close 20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Black Rifle Coffee, America's coffee. Keep crushing. Today's gear segment is sponsored by Zero Foxtrot. Zero Foxtrot provides unique products that reflect the old school vintage military lifestyle. I've actually been following these guys for a while. Love what they're doing. Have a bunch of other shirts and coffee mugs downstairs from uh, uh, from the last few years. Just love it when guys get out and absolutely crush it. Zero Foxtrot is veteran founded and is a proud supporter of our nation's defenders, veterans, and first responders. I'm actually wearing this shirt. Look at that. Canoe Club USA. What does that mean? I think you're going to have to look it up in your web browser, the Google machine. Canoe Club USA. Awesome shirts out there. They have limited edition ones that drop every now and again that are super cool. So definitely go to zerofoxtrot.com. And right now, we have an exclusive code for listeners of Danger Close. Use code JC at checkout for 20% off your order. Very cool. Remember, you can gear up with Zero Foxtrot and use code JC at checkout for 20% off your order. Just go to zerofoxtrot.com slash JC and remember to use code JC for 20% off at checkout, or just click the link in the description. Once again, that offer code is JC. Gear up with Zero Foxtrot and use code JC for 20% off. Awesome. Definitely do that and check out all they have going on. Follow them on the social channels. They have some great things out there. They do some history posts every now and again that are really cool and very well thought out. Definitely check out zerofoxtrot.com for all the stuff. They have Zippo lighters in there. They have these mugs right here. What does that say? Drink coffee, stack bodies, stay zero. Love this. And then this one right here, this is cool. This might be a limited edition one. I'm not sure. Um, but for St. Patrick's Day, lack fear, not beer. Look at that. Boom. Love it. Awesome. So that's what they look like right there. Zero Foxtrot. And get a little of that action right there. That's a sticker. But uh, check out their t-shirts, mugs right here. Whiskey glasses. These are some of my favorites right there. Look at that. Oh yeah. Solid. So check them out for sure. Zerofoxtrot.com slash JC for 20% off. Welcome to the gear highlight portion the Danger Close podcast. I want to talk about the Vickers guides today. If you've been following me for a little while, you know how important those are to me uh, as an author because they are my first stop when I am writing about different weapons, obscure weapons, I want to go deep into uh, a certain weapon system. Uh, they have an amazing collection of guides. This one is a new edition of the 1911. So Larry Vickers, James Rupley takes the photos. They're incredible. And uh, you can get them in these slip cases right here that are really nice. And then the photos inside are absolutely incredible. Ton of amazing, amazing information. And uh, I absolutely love these things. So vickersguide.com, check out everything they have going on over there. Uh, great group of people, incredible contributors to these as well, subject matter experts uh, in the field. So uh, awesome. And this is volume one, there's a volume two right here. And that's the Slipcase. Very cool. Vickersguide.com. What else do I have going on here today? All right. Who is not a member of the exclusive copy, coffee subscription club for Black Rifle Coffee? Uh, if you do that, you get something special every month. This is uh, the green team right there. So they have some uh, really interesting coffees that they send you each month. This is the Battle Sasquatch right there. Bam. And you get a little something that tells you how to make it, different ways to make it. And let's see, what else do we have here? This one, Riding Poseidon, once again, gives you some options there. And look at that artwork. There it is. Chris Hunt, did you do that? Awesome. Follow him for sure. Uh, Laissez faire on the Instagram. And here's one. Hmm. Beaver Destroyer. Hmm. Interesting. Check him out, blackriflecoffee.com. It's delicious. And oh, check out those two. 
Thank you for tuning into the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. Find out more about Tim Kennedy at timkennedymma.com. Follow him on Instagram, also at Tim Kennedy MMA, and check out his new book, Scars and Stripes. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA. You can check out the merch jackcarusa.com and go to the website officialjackcar.com for everything else. And my latest novel, In the Blood, is out now in hardcover ebook and audiobook wherever books are sold. Thank you so much for tuning in. Sincerely appreciate it. Take care out there. Stay safe. Be strong. Keep fighting.